Before today's video, I'd like to invite you to An Evening with Constantine Kissin. He's the author of An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West and the co-host of the hugely popular Trigonometry podcast. He'll be touring Australia in February and March, giving a fresh perspective that's both enlightening and engaging. To book your tickets, head to our website, cis.org.au, or click the link in the description. I'll see you there. To the fact that my grandmother gave birth to 11 children in the bush, you know, out bush. These are my ancestors, the toughest survived. And sometimes I think if they could see the bunch of whinges that Australia's become today, they'd be rolling in their graves. I'm Rob Forsyth and this is Liberalism in Question. My guest is someone, at least in the second half of 2023, is well known right across Australia. Um, she's Senator Jacinta Nabajimba Price. Welcome. You know, you are so famous that when I put this meeting in my diary, in my iPhone, I put N-A-M and it came up automatically. And it, what's the word, uh, the, spell, the spelling suggestion was your name. There we go. How good is that? <laughs> so I thought you want to know you've become famous in the world. Now, um, welcome and thank you very much. I know it's been a busy time for you and I appreciate you making it available. Um, although the... We're speaking just after the referendum in uh, in late November, in late October rather. I want to speak in a, a, a much broader range than just getting into the weeds of something which has now mm. passed. Mm. And I want to talk especially about the status quo in Indigenous affairs mm. and your vision for a new vision of Indigenous affairs, a much more liberal vision for Indigenous affairs. Mm. So I'll put it this way, what, what do you understand is the status quo of Indigenous affairs in Australia? Oh, there's um, dependence, welfare, dependence, dependence on governments uh, and organisations and bureaucracies that are somehow tasked with improving the lives of Indigenous Australians um, as opposed to uh, empowering the individual. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of groupthink. So let me unpack the groupthink. I assume that the proponents don't talk about dependence. They're talking about something else, self-determination. That's how they frame it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, and that's been a policy for, what, about 50 years. Mm. But in your view, it's failed. Absolutely. Absolutely, it's failed. Uh, you know, I think, uh, and I often say, you know, when I see the picture of Whitlam pouring the sand into Lingiari's hand, uh, you know, to me that was, you know, he was, he loved the fact that he was framed as the hero champion of Indigenous Australians. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm handing you your land back. But to me, it's... It was a handing over of well welfare dependency. You know, you can be land rich, but you're going to be dirt poor um, through the Land Rights Act. Yes, were. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, this idea that we've done terrible things in our history, so therefore we will now leave you to your own devices, which at that stage I think was um, detrimental for Indigenous Australians because it was thought, well, you know, you, you can't. You can't, you know, impose um, changes, such rapid changes on a group of individuals, not see them through to the end um, and then just leave them hanging, I don't think. Uh, it was like being handed the keys to a car but not being taught how to drive for a lot of Indigenous Australians. And there were measures such as the equal pay decision, which I think was all, you know, well-intentioned, but it meant a lot of Aboriginal people lost their jobs as a result of that. The unions... Um, took advantage of that. They suggested they only wanted to give equal pay to Indigenous Australians who joined the unions. Oh uh, uh, and then that was coupled with access to alcohol and welfare. Uh, so that was when things, I think, began to get worse. For so so from, you understand the policy of self-determination, in a sense, was irresponsible given where, where if remote Indigenous people were. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, because all of a sudden it was, um, you know, where it's against the law to not send your child to school. Suddenly it was like, okay, live the, live the way, live your own way, live, you know, live attached to your country and your land and spirituality. Um, you know, take on the modern tools if you like. That's your choice, but we're not gonna have, we're not gonna force anything onto you. Um, but basically, I feel like a lot of people were left to their own devices because of that sense of guilt uh and, and and i think from then on also you know and and other 
prime ministers going forward um, would suggest that Aboriginal Australians have been victims of, of white Australia. And that narrative has stuck and it's still to this day. And I think that's it removes our agency. It suggests that we will only be empowered by a government, by um, the coloniser, in other words, white Australians, who owe us something, uh, but therefore they, they hold the power um, to our to us being able to move forward, whereas we know that you know guilt politics hasn't worked, um, the, the victim mentality hasn't worked. It's all been very stifling. So, if I, I may speak on behalf of the rest of the nation, <laughs> <laughs> white Australia guilt, and I come back to that just a moment. Why we feel guilty, and in giving, trying to do the best, which is give self empowerment. The Indigenous people hearing the message, you are victims, mm -hmm. both feed into a system that is destructive on both. Mm. Let me start with the white guilt secret, get out of the way. <laughs> um, in your press club, um, in your press club address, National Press Club address earlier this year, mm. um, you completely stunned the uh, Guardian journalist mm. who thought he had a, was bowling you a, 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 a full toss, but it was more than that. But you said he was an ongoing effects of colonialism mm. and you deny there were any. Mm. It's not even bad at going to fix. Mm. Unfortunately, you only had a very short moment, and I know that your critics and even some of your supporters said, oh, that was an overstatement. And mm. ta -ta -ta. But I think you actually were quite serious about that. Mm. And I think I'd like to hear more of the context in which you said it, because mm. that's such an unusual thought. Mm. I think surely she couldn't have said that, but you did say it and you meant it. I did mean it. I did mean it. And more broadly, what I meant was while, you know, there, I, I wasn't denying that Previously, the effects of colonisation had brought about devastation. Um, but right now, in Australia in 2023, the modernisation of our country has brought extraordinary opportunity for Indigenous Australians. Um, and the prime examples are those who have fought for the S campaign. Uh, they are educated, they have influence, they have power. Um, they are not worrying about, you know, what happens when they go to bed at night. They're sleeping comfortably. Uh, and and the improvements that Australians in general want for our most marginalised is evident, and yes. we're all striving for that. I remember being another. rather surprised watching a television show in which a woman, I think, where were we were I think she was overseas on something, was telling us how colonialism had damaged her life. I thought, if you were, it wasn't for colonialism, you'd be doing what, what exactly tonight? Yeah. Um, you'd be still <laughs> hunter gathering. Well, that's right. Well, I wouldn't exist, for starters, um, <laughs> because obviously... You know, I have ancestors who were convicts as well. Um, you know, the vast majority of the activist class wouldn't exist because they are a mixed heritage predominantly. So you, you, am I, you're distinguishing the genuinely woeful effects, not just of the fact of colonisation, but the way it was done in many ways in the, in the history of Australia, particularly in the 19th century, mm -hmm. to the situation today. That's a distinction you're very keen to draw. Absolutely. And that's a distinction not drawn by, by your critics. That's exactly right. They um, continue to want to live in a past 200 years ago as opposed to recognising, um, you know, the incredible country that we do have, the opportunities that do exist uh, within this country right now. And because of that inability to um, be that gratefulness, to have any great, be grateful for what we do have, again, it's part of the whole guilt politics issue where we're stifled and we, we, we can't, you know, move forward from that. And that, as you mentioned, again, rather surprisingly, uh, running water and food supply. Mm. Which I thought, wow, that's a, that's a low bar. <laughs> but if, and I realised, thinking from the, your, your distant ancestors, both things were very hard to find. Well, my grandfather. My grandfather came into contact with, uh, uh, with white Australians uh, in his early adolescence. Wow. So his life was, uh, was you know, the hunter-gatherer life uh, up until a point. And for my family in the desert, it was kill or be killed. Um, you know, um, violence is used as a, as a means of social control, like all small-scale societies on earth. Um, we in the desert had very little access to, well, any running water unless it was raining um, and, 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 and access to the, you know, the food that we have nowadays is, is just readily available. I mean... This this was not available in my grandparents' generation up until a point. I shall my well now your grandfather, I believe, was not treated well by the white people who met him 
In fact, there'd been a massacre in the, early on mm. around that time, I correct, in the Alice Springs. Mm. And yet, as I remember you was telling me uh, earlier, he did not have resentment against this. Can you explain hmm. what that's a remarkable response? Yeah, so we uh, experienced the last sanctioned massacre in 1929 in our country. Wow. My grandfather was um, <clears throat> a child at the time. And because my family was so close to the action, they held responsible um, a, a member of our family who they felt if if weren't wasn't for his actions where he murdered uh, a, a white man, a dingo hunter, um, then it wouldn't wouldn't have brought on that response. So he, um, they they put some of that responsibility on him, um, because he lived to to old age, whereas many of our family members were killed because of this massacre. But we also held a commemorative ceremony twenty five years, sorry seventy five years after it took place, and invited the descendants of those who literally killed our family, because my family wanted to recognise uh, this as a healing process to say, we don't blame you for literally what your grandfather did to our family. We recognise that these were hard times in our country hi country's history. We, you know, we had we had commonly tried to take out our enemies and they tried to take out us. You know, it was, it was tough. Um, and, and they saw that in that broader context of um, the frontier as well. But they wanted, they recognised that things had changed. We're now at this stage in Australia... <clears throat> We're all part of this country together and we want to move forward together. And that element of, I guess, forgiveness was uh, centre stage. And, and that to me is what true reconciliation looks like. Yes. Unfortunately, we have a grievance industry that doesn't want to take that next step. Any special reason why your father, your grandfather rather, um, chose a forgiveness path? You're, 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 because that's still, even from your culture, that's not an easy thing to do. Forgiveness is not, as I understand, traditional mm -hmm. Aboriginal culture. Is there, some, was there some religious activity or a Christian? Was something, was something else going that led to this remarkable? I think, I think uh, in traditional terms, in order for to be, you know, not just survive but thrive in a harsh environment, yep. you can't, you have to move forward from things. You can't hold on to things forever. So, I mean, in traditional terms, if someone has, you know, caused an injustice, they usually are prepared to ha put themselves forward for a punishment, for a violent punishment, like a spearing in the leg, and then everything is forgotten about. When, once that punishment has taken place, in traditional terms, you move forward. You don't. But there was no back. punishment of the white man in this situation. No, no. But it also has to be done while what they say while the blood is still hot. Right. It has to be done immediately. It can't be done later on. And this is why the concept of inherited guilt is something you have no track with, it seems to me. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. There is that. But also, I mean, Christianity has played a huge role in a lot of the lives of Indigenous Australians. I mean, my, my grandparents, um, you know, it depends what community you came from, the, the, the Baptist missionaries were in Yundamu. My grandparents were part of that oh, right. church as well. And for a lot of Indigenous people, it's never replaced our spirituality, but become another layer on top of. Right. And it's thought that, you know, even the way the logic of my own family members, they will say, you know, when someone has been through their um, their years of rebellion and turmoil and, you know, often drinkers, uh, you know, those who have been heavy drinkers and then come out the other end and survived that and changed, they often become Christian. So it's thought that, well, if you're Christian, you're a non-drinker, you're all of these yeah. things, you, you've grown, you've grown up. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to pop up and remind you to hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon. It really helps us to grow this channel and continue to share good ideas. And don't forget, you can become a member and find exclusive content at our website, sias.org.au. Enjoy the rest of your video. Now, your attitude to your traditional culture is, I think, ambivalent. There are things about it that you treasure Mm. There are some things about it you think are quite dysfunctional mm. and, and therefore the uh, romancing of the primitive, the noble savage, mm. which is a great trope in Western culture. It's had other versions. Black, Black Emu is a good example of an attempt to turn Dark them in. Emu. Dark Emu. Well, yes, what, sorry, absolutely. Attempt to turn indigenous people into sort of primitive yeoman farmers. Mm. Um, uh, 
And that strikes me as very strong at the moment. I find a lot of talking about mm. it's to the point where it's not even possible to mention the mm. downside of Indigenous culture. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, largely, okay. largely the narrative around Indigenous Australia has been held by those who haven't lived traditional culture, who have had access to education. The romanticism comes from, I think, a sense of loss of not having culture. Um, but for those that live it also, the fact that they haven't had access to education doesn't provide the opportunity to um, reflect uh, or, 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 you know, determine, well, why have we done these things? Why has our culture evolved in this way going forward? And then um, and then articulate that to a wider audience. It's sort of like, no, we've always done this this way and that's how it is. So you contrast, you know, that and then you contrast those who romanticise it um, and then there's someone like me in the middle who goes, well, I understand both and I also know that as human beings, if we need to, if we, in order to progress, there are elements of that from our traditional side that we need to relinquish that is no longer good for us but take with us what enriches our lives um, and in, into the modern world. Um <clears throat> to progress with humanity, uh, but the ideology of the left suggests that, you know, it's all you hear it over again, you know. Aboriginal people need to, con- you know, connect it to culture and country and it's so romantic. Um, and there's elements of that that are lovely, but realistically we're just human beings and within our culture there are terrible things as well and we have to confront and it, and that the the great message of 65,000 years and counting of continuous culture yeah <laughs> um, um which I, again strikes me as, i understand why people might say that but my ancestors are as old as your ancestors mm. <laughs> you follow what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and maybe the not maybe the continuous itself may be part of the problem the isolation and and the and the remarkable survival i, I do i take away from a moment the, mm. the remarkable survival of australian of first Australians, yes, um, but in the in the modern world, some of those things are going to be completely inappropriate and, and, and worse than inappropriate, actually damaging to you. Well, it's not just and it's not just that; it's the recognition of the the modern Aboriginal person isn't actually steeped in the traditional culture of sixty five thousand years ago. It, there's only elements of that that have come through, and we are now entwined with uh, a shared Australian culture, and and. So you can't disengage with the modern world, right? You, you can't. You can't say, let's form a, let's form a um, special place where indigenous people go back, go back to the way things were in 1780. Yes. <laughs> right? It's or, impossible. Can't be done. And therefore, the, 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 you need a way for that really does move people into the world that exists. Yes, absolutely. And some of our most successful middle-class um, people of indigenous heritage in this country have the formula, have successfully... <laughs> you know, uh, been through uh, the formula, have applied that formula to their lives. Now, tell me about yourself because you had a number of your family severely damaged. There have been violence, there's been deaths in your family, you've been touched quite personally. Mm. Yet here you are, mm. the minister, the shadow minister for Indigenous Affairs. Mm. What happened? I think I just, um, you know, I've grown up tough. <laughs> I've grown up tough uh, in a place like Alice Springs. I've seen everything. There's nothing that I haven't seen or experienced. And um, because of having that life experience, I know that there's a better way forward and um, I I can see what the obstacles are in in the way of moving forward for for particularly those that I love, my family, whose lives I want to save, that I don't want to see any more death, I don't want to see any more destruction um, and violence and I want, you know, in a country like ours in 2023, we should be able to stand up for the human rights of our most marginalised. There is no reason we cannot do that. So this is personal, not just theoretical for you, just it a price. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's absolutely personal um, to me. And uh, and and also, uh, I mean, I, 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 know, I know what a bully is. <laughs> I've never liked bullies, and I'll always stand up to bullies. Now, you, you, you make, I heard you make a comment the other day that feminism has not come to the Indigenous peoples mm. and that there's no Me Too movement in, in tech. Can you tell us, unpack that a little further for us? Yeah, so uh, because we're framed as um, victims, 
you know, even perpetrators, Aboriginal male perpetrators are viewed as victims, so therefore we can't hold them to account. There's always an excuse for their behaviour. Um, traditionally, you know, when the Aboriginal uh, rights movement took place, uh, you had, I mean, for example, Marlene Cummins had came out uh, in a documentary that was filmed by Rachel Perkins about how she had experienced sexual assault and rape by members of the Aboriginal Black Panthers movement yeah. in Australia uh, because women were told, no, you are to fight for the benefit of our race, therefore putting your um, you know, rights as women um, behind that movement. And it hasn't changed. It has not changed. Um, and when we try, when I try to argue about the rates of violence in remote communities, uh, we're always told it's a result of white colonisation and white men. Uh, and we're denied the reality that it is, in fact, an acceptance of violence within traditional culture, um, that women are, it's a patriarchal society we're dealing with. Women are not as important as men. Certainly girls are at the bottom of the ladder right. when it comes to hierarchy uh, in our society. <clears throat> we, even women, will side with that narrative. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the sad part about it all, which is why I put it back on leftist Indigenous women when they argue for the rights of. Does this imply a certain nervousness <clears throat> that if if there was an honest, realistic if, pre pre appreciation of the strengths and weaknesses hmm. of traditional society, the weak what should be shown to shape? If they out, if that's it's, if they'll th condemn it all, they somehow fear that if you've mentioned a weakness, yeah. somehow it's going to be put down. Is, is that what I'm picking up? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just have to look at the reaction of um, putting forward, uh, you know, the call for a royal commission of the sexual abuse of Indigenous children. The reaction, you know, it's brought all of those organisations that said they would fall silent, um, who 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 were mourning the loss of the voice referendum. They've now they're now back into you know the swing of things. We've ended their silence because they have all come out to say we don't need a royal commission in the sexual abuse of our children, when we know... We need something, though, don't we? We absolutely need something when we know that their evidence is stark that our children experience the highest rates of sexual abuse in the country. Our women are, uh, experience violence at the highest rates. And you're country. not saying this is the legacy of colonialism? No. No, no. I'll, 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 it's not the legacy of colonialism. I will say that colonialism certainly um, has had a negative impact on... Um, uh, in in terms of this, absolutely, but I, but I'm not put putting all blame at the feet of colonialism because that makes everyone responsible and yet no one responsible yeah. at the same time. Um, and this has to come down to, I mean, <clears throat> for example, you know, the fact that, I mean, girls were married off at the age of twelve, thirteen, to um, men who were significantly older than they were. The fact that there's a number of women in my own family who have experienced sexual assault by their promised husbands when they were 13 year olds, um, you know, and the evidence is all there, and yet um, trying to fight for the rights of Indigenous women from um, a position of truth and honesty is the hardest thing to try to get the Aborig Aboriginal industry to come on board with. And we spent a while talking about what's wrong <laughs> and why the solution is not right. What's the way forward for you hmm. at, or in for Australia? Hmm. Tell us what your vision is. So I think, I mean, I'm really humbled um, and grateful that the vast majority of Australians agree with my position uh, on these issues. Um, that well, they, but I'm not sure they know you. But I think they agree with the voice wasn't a good idea, but I think there's a lot, a lot further to go on in Oh, yeah, well, well, of as, as, absolutely. And part of what I've been arguing right throughout the debate was to um, to halt, uh, you know, apply for better accountability, certainly on the Aboriginal industry, um, to improve the lives, certainly of our of our children, of our women, of our most marginalised. There's no shortage of goodwill from the Australian people um, toward that. So for me, the work that I want to do with my um, colleague Karen Little is we are now, you know, we're calling for these inquiries. We're calling for this Royal Commission. Uh, we want to develop policy um, around streamlining um, the Aboriginal industry, uh, applying better accountability 
so that um, we do see the outcomes that are required. But I'd like to see a shift away from um, race-based policy to make it more needs-based policy. That's what I'd like to do going forward. So that means don't ask if a person's Aboriginal or not or Indigenous, ask them if they're poor or suffering. Yes. Because you did make that rather provocative comment that although you are shadow minister, you'd like to see a day when there was no minister for Aboriginal Australians. Exactly. Uh, and which is something that when my mother was part of the Giles government, um, they did was they scrapped... This is the Northern Territory? In the Northern Territory, yes. They scrapped the um, the Minister for Indigenous uh, uh, Territorians portfolio. They did set up an office, Office for Indigenous uh, Territorians, which then all portfolios could be engaged with. Um, but the idea was to take that step away. Is not the existence of land rights inconsistent with that, though? The fact mm. that we have identified, and rightly so, I think, mm. the fact that prior ownership does still exist. And so mm. there's a way in which... There'll always be some special rights of, indiv- of, of groups of people. Hmm. Well, I guess if it, we're all landowners in some sense. Hmm. But is that consistent with, uh, with your removing race from the... No, and that's another issue that I'd like to... Yeah. I'd love to be able to review the Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory right. and if it requires um, a scrapping or, or a, a reformation, that's what we need to do because I think traditional owners, as I said, are land rich, dirt poor... The communal ownership model has not been working. Uh, you know, private uh, ownership of private property is something that is available to all Australians except Aboriginal Australians in remote communities. In fact, it seems to me the more I hear you, the more I think you're saying it's some of the principles of classical liberalism that you actually think are good for Indigenous Australians. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Aboriginal people, you know, education is important, but so is economic independence, which, you know... All other Australians have the opportunity toward that. In remote communities, what you have is enclaves, socialist enclaves and dependency on welfare as opposed to Indigenous Australians having the opportunity to utilise their resources to be job creators in their own right. Do you think there's still a future for remote communities still in, in this model of yours? Uh, the, sorry. You... Well, I mean, the very remoteness creates a whole range of problems. Mm-hmm. Um I think someone said you could either have modern medical outcomes or remote living, but to put them mm. together, very difficult. Mm. I think, I think the whole, you know, everything needs to be reevaluated and reassessed, and it needs to be taken into consideration whether there are some communities that are just living off life support, basically yeah. in terms of welfare, welfare, whether they, um, whether they should be. Um, you know, those, those, re- those residents should be taken to larger communities or, you know, closed, closing down of those places that are just held up um, o- on welfare in that way, whether that the sustainability are around them and the benefit, the quality of life for those people living that way is just not good for them. Well, we should be offering them better. Tell me about your grandfather. Well, my grandfather was tough and deeply loving, but... He was never an individual who complained. He never was anybody's victim. And I think that was the mentality of certainly Warpri people living in such a harsh climate. You couldn't, you couldn't be a snowflake, you know. You couldn't feel sorry for yourself because that could very well lead to death. It, 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 you know. So I was never taught to be uh, anybody's victim. Um, and that they're the sorts of values that certainly my grandfather, my grandmother instilled in me. I mean, I take my hat off to the fact that my grandmother gave birth to 11 children in the bush, you know, out bush. These were my ancestors, the toughest survived. And sometimes I think if they could see the bunch of whinges that Australia's become today, they'd be rolling in their graves to know that, well, we've overcome, you know, <laughs> centuries um, of uh, living off a harsh desert environment, not just surviving but thriving and also with an incredible sense of humour, then what is going on with modern day Australian... But, so there is Australian. something from your traditional culture which has greatly strengthened you in this task, mm-hmm. even as you're talking about Indigenous people need now become part of a modern world and mm-hmm. not stay in the bush like that. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, and I think my, my grandfather was a visionary. He saw his first engagement, he was intrigued by his first engagement with 
white Australians and he saw the world moving and he knew he had to be part of that What change. do you think they were? Well, so a lot of Aboriginal people, mob thought that they were um, ghosts. Right. Ghosts of ancestors who right. had come back until they realised that we're dealing with a different set of human beings here. I mean, my, my grandfather, you know, you had to work, you had to provide for your family, um, otherwise you didn't survive. Uh, he became part of the modern world. He did various different jobs. Uh, he took m- mail on camelback. He he was a labourer. He helped build Alice Springs. Um, he worked as a tracker for police. He was a groundsman at the school, and he saw. He also saw that education was now becoming the tool for survival, and made sure that my mother and her siblings uh, received an education. Um, and he also. Like he, he was embarrassingly proud of the fact that my father was white. He saw that as a coming together of the two worlds with my parents. And he, and he also, I mean, he said to me, I remember he was blind when I was a little girl. And I remember I must have been about 10 and I, and I sat on his lap and, you know, and he sort of, you know, seeing how, how big I'd grown. And he goes, hey, it mustn't be far off now till you, you know, it's time for you to get married. <laughs> And I, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm only 10 years old. And he had a chuckle and he goes, oh, but you know what? When you, when it does come, when, you know, when you're growing up and it t- does come time for you to marry, he said, I want you to marry a white fella. And he didn't he, mention a Scotsman. He, 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 didn't, he didn't specifically say a Scot. He, he, I, I, you know. Well, just in case. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are white men and there are white men. on the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, um, but, and, and, and my, my dad sort of responded with, oh, you know what? She can she can marry whoever she wants, sort of thing, um, because he was embarrassed by that. But the truth was, what he meant by that was, I want to make sure that um, you know you continue to take advantage of the modern world, and um, you know that's he he wanted the best outcomes for me. He could see sort of the demise of our family too, and uh, and probably knew that within traditional culture. You know, the idea of me being married off in a traditional way was not the way to go anymore because my mother rebelled against that incredibly and she gained his support to not be forced into an arranged marriage. So you owe a lot of the, your embrace of, of a new vision for Indigenous people to your grandpa. Absolutely. The man who first met white people. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed a strange contradiction in the, the voice that failed. Um, it was to be, to, meant to give Indigenous people a voice mm. and yet... It was said it'd be equal men and women, yeah. which is a modern Western cultural imposition. Hmm. I just thought, that's interesting. Well, that's right. I mean, the proponents of the voice will pick and choose yes. where they think uh, and also, uh, you know, reinvent culture in their own image <laughs> of what they want. So, I mean, the whole concept of the voice itself goes against traditional culture. You know, you can't have a representative from somewhere else representing your your, your, mob. Your, your mob, right. Yeah, uh, and speaking to the traditional owners at Uluru, they were really upset at the fact that whenever the Minister Linda Burney came to visit, she didn't show, She showed no interest. In fact, all of the Yes campaigns showed no interest in the jukurpa, but the dreaming, the spirituality of the place. But they took the name in order to exploit it wow. for a political purpose. So they absolutely did the wrong thing in terms of traditional culture. And every time they visited uh, Murujulu, they would never come in and say, hello, we are here, this is why we're here. They, they would fly in, have their photo shoot no, welcome and to take off. Oh, don't worry, they, they, they had to pay for, they paid for that, they paid for the dances, um, for the photo shoot opportunity, and then they would go again. Well, it sounds like it's time for realism in Indigenous policy in this country. Absolutely. (laughs) Thanks for watching. It really helps us to spread the ideas of liberty when you hit like and subscribe and click the little bell icon. I'll see you in the comment section.